Three years ago, I drove down to this house, which I did not own and was a completely barren lot. And now here I stand three years later with a pretty impressive garden, if I have to say so myself. But not only that, a thriving homestead where I'm capturing my own water, producing a lot of my own electricity, growing my own hens for my own eggs and developing a ton of these homesteading skills. So in this video, I wanna take you through some of the things that I've learned that I find to be the most important when you're starting out on a homesteading journey. One of the first things I did is replicate my original Epic Garden back in my small front yard urban space. And I found that it was super rewarding to have the space and to grow all the vegetables. I have beets, kale, carrots, whatever you can imagine popping out of the garden. But when you talk about homesteading, you have to learn what to do with all that produce. Take this plot right here. Right now, it is actually our epic top secret test garden. In fact, Paul in the background, he is working on a top secret project, but it used to be a wheat field. I grew a ton of wheat right here and the proceeds of which are in my hand. I still have a little bit left and I had to figure out, okay, cool. It's fun that you like to grow all this crazy weird stuff, Kevin, but you have to figure out how to use it. And that's where I discovered a love for baking. When you grow your own wheat, you obviously have to do something with it. And the way I found to use it was to get into making my own sourdough bread. So I stole some sourdough starter from Jacques on our team. I've kept it alive for a year or so. Pretty proud of that. And then proceeded to make one of the most aesthetically disgusting loaves you've ever seen. It was like a manhole size and Jacques called it the horseshoe crab, but I still was hooked, much like I was hooked when I first started gardening. So what I've started to do is use some of my own homegrown product, whether it be the actual wheat itself or the potatoes and the rosemary and the herbs and the eggs that we produce here at the Epic Homestead in recipes. And I've been doing this pumpkin brioche that I really love. By the way, this video is sponsored by Bosch, which unbeknownst to me, I seem to have a ton of their gear in my house. In fact, my dishwasher is also Bosch. But this mixer, which I've wanted to try for a very long time, which kind of doubles as food processor, ice cream maker, et cetera, that's when I'm gonna be making this pumpkin brioche. And so we're super thankful to Bosch for sponsoring the video, allowing us to bring some really cool content. This is a cool mixer, guys. I really am a fan of it. Tons of crazy attachments you can add to really extend the functionality. But in this case, we're gonna be using it to make the brioche. So let's start mixing. So I had 80 grams, it looks like, of the whole wheat. So I need about 270 of all purpose. So the crazy part I learned about brioche is you cut in like a ton of butter, which I'm not mad about. So in goes one stick. Okay, I've got my little ball of brioche and now it's going to go into for about two and a half hours. We're gonna rise this thing till it about doubles. So I'll see you then. Powering a homestead is no small feat. It actually takes energy, surprise, surprise. And you wanna have a plan to develop at least some of that energy on your own property. So for me, here in sunny San Diego, California, that was solar up on the roof. Welcome to the roof, my friends. 24 solar panels pumping out juicy, juicy wattage 24-7, 365. So solar is obviously a topic that is very dependent on where you live, not only for the sun conditions of your area, but also for the regulatory climate and the energy climate of your area. So for example, here in San Diego, California, it's quite sunny, so it's a great opportunity to install some solar. We have a tax credit of about 22% or so, at least when I installed my panels, and my energy company allows me to do what's called net metering. So let's say one month, I use 1,000 kilowatts, but I generate 1,500 kilowatts. What's gonna happen is my energy company will say, basically you're about 500 kilowatts credit that you can use for a future month when you actually consume more than you produce. So I can't cash that out for cold hard cash, unfortunately, but I basically have a bank. So in the sunny months, when I'm really not using a whole lot of energy to heat the home, et cetera, I'm generating a massive surplus, basically spinning the meter backwards. And then in winter right now, when I actually do wanna heat up the house, cause this is a 100 year old house that isn't insulated well, I'm actually using a little bit more energy than I'm producing because especially in winter, the solar energy production drops off. That's actually not light for as long, right? The days are shorter. So it's this very complex math, but generally speaking, I'm gonna be able to pay off my investment in the solar in about six to eight years, after which I am more or less generating all of my energy for free. Just a few more things on solar, maintenance wise. Every quarter, maybe every half a year, you wanna come up, wash them off. 
had a lot of crows on here kind of pooping on them, a lot of dirt, you'll actually get an efficiency production gain of about two to 3%. I've measured it before just by hosing these off. And then you might have to replace your roof. So something to consider when you're pricing this out. Really important to be cost conscious. In my case, like I said, it's a 100 year old house. The solar installer said, we won't do it unless you replace your roof. So I had to price that in and that was an unfortunate hit. Even still, it ended up being a pretty net positive investment, like I said, after about six to eight years. And then the final thing I will say is go in clear headed on this investment. There are a lot of different ways to go wrong, a lot of different ways to do it, but if you value producing some energy at your own house, to me, there's really no other option than solar. And then you can get into solar batteries, which allows you to actually truly live off grid for a period of time should an emergency strike. The next thing I need to share with you is how important I've found water harvesting, specifically rainwater harvesting. And no matter what I say, no matter how many times I talk about it, someone will always say, that's illegal. It is not. Actually, in any of the 50 states, you can capture at least some of your own rainwater. In Colorado, unfortunately, my friends, you can only have either 55 or 110 gallons. I forgot which, but you kind of give us your water. So thank you for that. Either way, I think it's very important to say thank you to Mother Earth as it rains the life force of life itself down upon you. And so what I've done here, this is just one of three different water capture systems I have on the property. This is the simplest one to understand. So you have a little awning right here. Think of that as your roof. You have a gutter that captures the sort of pure, unadulterated rainwater and all the debris off of your roof. That's gonna come down into this system right here, which is called a leaf filter. So if I was to pop this off, I've got a bunch of debris here that would have gone into my tank, probably clogged the lines up. So every so often you wanna clean that out. But you might be wondering, how is the water gonna get over here? Because isn't it just gonna fall right down this pipe? That's how water works. It follows the rules of gravity. And the answer is yes, it's actually going to go down this pipe first. Why? Because there is particulate matter, little tiny little bits of dirt that's actually smaller than that filter. And it's gonna fall into what's called a first flush filter. This is basically just three or four inch PVC pipe that holds a column of water, the first column of water that falls when it rains. And the reason that's important is because that's gonna be your dirtiest little bit of water. When it fills up to this level, water's of course gonna divert into here and go into your tank. So something I have to do when it rains is I come down here, there's a little hose nozzle, and I turn that nozzle. And what that's gonna do, making use of my resources here, is that's going to drain off into a productive patch in my garden. In this case, it's going into my artichoke patch. I wait for that to run out, and then I'll turn this back off, thus plugging this, emptying it, and setting it up for the next rain. And whenever I wanna use my actual rainwater, I can hook a hose attachment up here and just let this go, and there you go. I have about 200 gallons of beautiful rainwater. So this is a small system, but let me show you what this looks like at scale. Welcome my friends to the backyard. This passion fruit vine, in fact, is hiding one of my most prized possessions here at the homestead, which is a 5,500 gallon rainwater cistern. This is what's collecting almost all of the water off of my main home, the roof that I was on when I was showing you the solar panels. The same system will capture it, but it's actually coming down a buried pipe that will drop into the other side of this cistern and it filters it much the way that the smaller system did. The only thing I'll say, and this is something that I didn't think I, I don't really think I knew when I came into the homesteading journey is that rainwater capture is almost always going to be more expensive than just using your city tap. So on a cost basis, you're making an investment that you're probably not going to fully recoup. But the way I think about water capture is when you need it, it's priceless. Right? And so that's the way I've approached it. I want to show you how do you get water out of this thing, right? I got 5,000 gallons in here. How do I actually use it? Well, there's a couple different ways. First of all, the water, you can see your level by just popping open this little top right here. It's quite full right now because it's winter and it's been raining. Secondly, you can get the water out much like you would in the cistern up front, but I've actually added this pressure sensitive pump and I'll show you how it works. It's actually on right now, but what it requires is water pressure to trigger from this side to actually fully activate. So this looks like I'm just pulling from the city hose, but I'm actually not. The second I squeeze this nozzle, it turns on that pump and I can use this to irrigate 
my pond area to irrigate the garden, to water the test garden, to refill the pond. There's a lot of different ways to use it. And believe me, I use it. And so the thing I'll say about rainwater capture, just to stress it, you can usually get some kind of rebate from the city. Usually for a cistern or a barrel, you can get maybe at least a couple hundred bucks, which that's not nothing. For something like this, it's a little bit more expensive. It's like one or $2,000. You maybe have to get some labor to install it. But again, it's one of those things where like, if you need it, you really need it. And on a suburban homestead like this, in an area that's traditionally very drought stricken here in San Diego, I figured it was worth the investment. All right, let's see what we got going on here. It's about a double rise. What I need to do is divide this into six roughly even pieces. The thing I've learned to make these brioche balls really easily is you basically create the claw. So you come in with a claw, you come around, and you just go. And it should get a little bit of debris on the bottom, that's okay. And then you get a nice little ball, just like that. Basically those little balls need to rise into one another, and that's what creates that beautiful brioche pull apart. So we'll see you in a sec. You know, there's a part of the journey into homesteading I don't think people talk about a lot, and that would be the stress and burnout and overall maybe anxiety that you might sometimes feel trying to make all this stuff happen. I know for myself over the last three or four years, things have gotten pretty crazy. You had a global pandemic, you had a boom in interest in gardening. Obviously that's the business that I run. That's the channel that I run. And so it got very hectic and very stressful. And I found myself for the first time in my life experiencing true anxiety and true panic attacks. And I found that having a hobby that has nothing to do with anything, it almost doesn't even matter is one of the most helpful things I found in my homesteading journey, even just my life journey, I've turned to wood carving. Actually, Jacques got me into it. He kind of picked it up and was talking all about it. And so I, I really got into it and I've been making, you know, my own little spoons and a butter knife and I'm working on a slotted spoon right now. It's not that good, but I'm working on it. And then I really got into like making little figurines and stuff. And so my point here is to say that it's not life or death. You know, you gotta figure out a way to live the life that you wanna live. And if you're killing yourself trying to get all this stuff done, you need to have a hobby to allow you to de-stress. This one's great because you actually get to do it with friends, hang out by the fire, get a pizza, whatever. But whatever it is for you, I highly recommend prioritizing it or three, four years down the line, you might find yourself like I found myself, 30 or 40 pounds overweight, more than I ever thought I would be in my life, stressed, having all these panic attacks, and, and something as simple as this has really helped me. You may be wondering why are we in your laundry room, Kevin? Well, that is because it is about resource management, guys. What better way to use water twice than your laundry? It actually puts out quite a bit of water and it has its own built-in pump. So it's like the perfect thing you could ever imagine to create what's called a gray water system. Now you do have to change your detergent. I use a detergent called Oasis and I just kind of pour a little dollop in it right there. Do my laundry as normal, but let me show you this a little magic. Look at this. So there's a system here, it's called a three-way valve. And if I pull it up like this, I am telling the system, which is the laundry pump, hey, pump all of that laundry water through this system right here and have it drop down under the house and go out and water something. And this is a really, really clever way to make double use of water because you can almost always get a rebate on installing this, sometimes up to about $500, which is about how much it costs to install. So you might not even be out of pocket. And let me show you where it goes. So if you look very closely, you will see a little PVC coming out of my house. I actually drilled a hole in the side of my house and that is where the laundry water pumps. Now, where does it pump? It actually comes straight down this line right here and into this patch with these absolutely beautiful artichokes. These are about three years old now. You can see there are these little irrigation valves here. That's where the water sprays out. One, two, three of them, kind of in this smiley face. You dig a little trench, fill it with wood chips as mulch, which allows that water to kind of spread out. And every time I run the laundry, which is like once or twice a week, I will have water perfectly irrigating these artichokes. They never get watered by anything that isn't the laundry water. And you might say, that's kind of gross, whatever, whatever. It's really not, guys. I mean, it really is not. I'm using a biodegradable soap and it's a few gallons of water every single time. And I've had some of my best artichoke years yet, but that's not the only way I'm using a gray water system. So I'm kind of crazy and I actually had a magic switch installed in my bathroom in my shower. 
So if you see this right here, it's up, which means it's going to the sewer water. But if I press it, you can hear a little actuator beneath the house turning a valve that's actually sending the water out to one of my most prized possessions. So this is one of my prized possessions. It's the outdoor shower. It's not the one I want to show you, but this one as well will rain down beautiful water, actually quite a relaxing experience. All of this water goes in to my productive front yard orchard. Now we get into a part of the homesteading experience that it's still gardening, but it's fruit tree care and orcharding. And it's so, so rewarding, but it just requires a different mindset, a lot more patience, and frankly, a lot more planning and knowledge. So take this side right here. This is one of my peaches, did really, really well this year. This is the first stuff I ever put in, which would be my 15 or so citrus that maybe two, three years later are finally starting to pay off. I mean, look at this Satsuma, absolutely delicious. If you're a California person, you know them as California cuties, which I used to eat all the time at recess back in elementary school. But the thing I wanna stress here is the planning, thinking ahead, because in orchard care, you're not gonna get a fruit for two, three years sometimes. Maybe you get it a little bit faster if you buy a bigger plant, but you wanna make sure that your plants aren't gonna run into each other, that you've selected the right varieties, that if it is a variety like an apple or a nectarine or a peach that requires what's called cold hours or frost hours, you wanna make sure that you actually get that amount of chill hours in your area. So in this case, there's basically like two apples I can grow in San Diego that work really well, similarly with peaches, but then Daddy Citrus just came home because this is the type of stuff that I can really grow in my climate. So I went buck wild with it. Now, if you have small space, I really recommend a method called backyard orchard culture. There's a guy named Tom Spellman out of Dave Wilson Nursery I've learned a lot from. And that's why you see me doing the unthinkable and planting my citrus four feet apart. There's about 15 citrus in this row, guys. And they are all very close together. Why? Because I actually don't need 270 limes, lemons, oranges, blood oranges, etc. I'd actually prefer like 40 or 50 a season of each. That's what I can do by keeping these trees a little bit smaller, a little bit tighter. So every single summer, it's called summer pruning, I'll come through and I'll just chop the canopy down. Actually, I'll do that with something like the peach, the apple, these pomegranates you'll see here, because yes, I am reducing production, but it's a backyard or front yard homestead approach in a suburban setting. So I just don't need that much. I wanna really stress that it's such a rewarding thing having a productive fruit orchard, but you do have to change your approach in how you manage it. Speaking of things that require patience, these little nuggets, my hens, getting into chicken keeping has been exceptionally rewarding, both just sort of personally having all these little animals around. It's been very enriching, but of course you get the eggs, right? And you get the chicken manure and you can use that manure in your garden system. So I've raised nine, actually 10, 10 hens from baby chick level. We lost one of them, our poor Gucci, but it's been so, so rewarding. And it just brings a richness to the experience that I think, I don't think I can do with that. I don't think I'm ever not gonna have chickens in some capacity. So the things that I would say, we've done many a guide on keeping chickens, is really decide how hard you're gonna go and start I would say kind of small because there's something called chicken math and I thought I'd never fall prey to it. I was like, you know what? I have six, I don't need any more. Now I have nine, right? And I'm thinking about maybe 12. So it's part of the journey. Butter, you wanna say hi to everyone? Oh, she does not. It's part of the journey and you're gonna have some high highs when you see your baby hens kind of raise and grow up and you know mature and start laying and producing. And you're gonna have some low lows. We've already lost a hen, unfortunately. It was a very sad day. I really did not take it very well for a little bit. So I thought maybe I was responsible, right? And so it's just a part of the journey I think is so valuable. I'm gonna show you the hen house over here in a second because not only do you get to in interact with them, you get their eggs, which like I said, my girlfriend and I, we have not bought eggs in over a year, but you get the manure, which is gardener and composters gold. So here's the hen house side of the coop. And it's probably a little bit dirty. So I'm a little embarrassed to show it to you, but you can tell there's quite a bit of chicken manure in here because the chickens, they'll roost on these little roosting bars and at night they're dropping droppings. So you can see, let me grab a little fork here, what I can do. So I can come in, scrape off this top layer with a bunch of chicken manure. And what I like to do is I don't apply this directly to the garden. It is what's called a hot manure, which means that 
It's actually quite active. And if you were to just apply that directly to the garden, in my opinion, not a great idea. You can burn your plants, but if you cycle it through a traditional hot composting system, it works really, really well. So that is what we tend to do. This is the five bay composting system, a very traditional composting method, roughly three cubic feet or three by three by three. You can go bigger, but you don't want to go much smaller than that. And so we use it in a left to right system. So you'll build a pile as that pile starts to break down. You use your compost fork and turn it, bring it down to here, then bring it down to here and you can see you start to get some really fine stuff. So that's how the chicken manure plays into the compost and the compost really is your catch all for all of the organic matter waste that's coming off of the homestead property, whether it be the food that you're growing in the garden or the food that you might be buying and supplementing that you have waste and scraps of, it all ends up here. So you can start to see how the homestead, suburban or otherwise, becomes almost a philosophy, right? The sun is shining in the sky, let's capture what we can and use what we can. The rain is falling from the sky, let's capture what we can, use what we can. I'm taking a shower, well, I'm gonna reroute that to an orchard which I'm going to use that fruit. Once I use that fruit, well, I'm not eating the rind of the orange and I'll throw it in here or I'll give it to the chickens. The chickens will eat it, they'll convert it into eggs, they'll convert some of that waste into droppings that will then come back into here. So you have this whole catch-all sort of cycle, circular, whatever you want to call it, system that just really works well. And when you have them all running, it is a beautiful thing. In the moment of truth, my friends, look at that. The rise. There is one more thing to do though. We're gonna use one more of my hen's eggs, make an egg wash, kind of fun. A little water, one egg, yolk, Mix it all up, and we're just gonna brush this over the top, give it that nice sort of golden brioche vibe. The time is here, my friends. Look at this. Tell me I shouldn't start a baking YouTube channel, right? I mean, come on, I'm gonna let this cool. Look at that, look at that. Pumpkin brioche. We're gonna let this cool for a second, and I will share with you my most important lesson. The journey of a homestead is not really complete if you're just doing it by yourself. That is why my final lesson for you, the thing that's most valuable, is the power of community. Here we go, the garden boys. It smells amazing in here. Yeah, a little brioche. <laughs> yeah, I'll say. So, Jacques, you guys know he's been on our team for quite some time. Paul, he has been on the team, but you haven't been on the camera. Yeah, a little you bit. Know, shy, there. shy guy Paul. Yeah. Call him Cactus <laughs> Paul. No, Cactus Paul is the new Jacques. Ian's the guy behind the camera. There's a ton of people here at Epic and also in a community that I think is important if you are enjoying That's the, the homesteading journey, you have to share it with someone, yeah. right? So, here you go, guys. You can see we're all very excited. A little brioche. Oh my gosh. Dude, it's steam. That's steam. Thank you. I don't know if you could see that steam vision Thank right you there. to Bosch for sponsoring Ooh. this video. By the way, I have a new book coming out, Epic wow. Homesteading, coming out in January. So you can check that out if you want to learn a little bit more about how to do all the stuff I just showed you in this video. What do you think, guys? Let's see. Oh, I got the <laughs> That's delicious, man. That's steam. My hat's literally off to you right now. <laughs> <laughs> you never see his hat off.